Good evening, everyone. Oh, I like the call and response. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Mary Watts, an executive dean of the New School for Public Engagement at the New School. And it's my privilege to welcome you here tonight to this exciting event um, sponsored by The Nation, Wages of Rebellion, a conversation with Chris Hedges and Cornell West. Um, I want to start by thanking The Nation Institute, The Nation Magazine, and Public Affairs Books for partnering with us on this event. And I want to give out a welcome to our live stream audiences and to the Real News Network audiences who are joining us tonight online. The New School was founded nearly 100 years ago on the, um, on the premise that education should be open, active, and should be focused towards a purpose. So in 1919, when we were beginning the New School, a lot of the dialogues and debate looked a lot similar to the ones we're going to have tonight. They um, invited people from various social and political and economic walks of life, brought together artists and creatives and writers and others to um, dialogue around pressing issues of the day, and mostly focused on T turning the idea of attention of education for the purpose of actually impacting the world's problems. Here we are nearly 100 years later, and we still have that same orientation to the world and its pressing issues. We focus um, in, in many ways on similar issues from our past, but also focusing more toward forward-looking issues, particularly around the issues of climate change, which is an initiative of the university in terms of addressing its own climate footprint and impacting communities around climate. In tonight's conversation, we're going to hear about some very current and pressing issues. Cornell West will engage Chris Hedges in a conversation about many of the recent popular uprisings, including those we've seen recently in Greece, to the Black Lives Matter movement, to the Fight for 15, and many others. And they'll be asking one another in a town hall style format the kinds of questions, are these events inevitable given the environmental decline and destruction we have? Is it necessary that these events occur because of the current wealth polarization that we're experiencing in this country and around the world? And are these issues related to the moral imperative of, revol of revolt? Tonight's conversation will challenge and question ideas of political correctness, anti-establishment movements, global climate change, and indeed capitalism itself. With Thank you. Looking forward to that part. Um, with Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and acclaimed author Chris Hedges and public intellectual, uh, academic, and activist Cornell West. So now let me introduce the two speakers, which is what it says on my script. But in fact, this is going to be a, um, a dialogue style with Chris and Cornell without a moderator. They'll be talking one to another in conversation. So first, let me introduce Chris Hedges, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and best-selling author of many books, including War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning, which was a finalist for the National Book Critic Circle Award for Nonfiction, Empire of Illusion, Death of the Liberal Class, and the New York Times bestseller, Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt. Chris's most recent work, Wages of Rebellion, The Moral Imperative of Revolt, was published this year by Nation Books and investigates the modern spirit of, rebe of rebellion fueled by global environmental calamity and widespread economic inequality. We're also joined tonight by Cornell West, a prominent public intellectual, celebrated author and professor. Cornell penned the now classic books, Race Matters and Democracy Matters, and he appears frequently in the media debating issues of political, cultural, and ethical importance. West's most recent book is Black Prophetic Fire, co-authored with Krista Buschendorf, and it examines the lives and contributions of six iconic African-American revolutionaries in the context of today's Black Lives Matter movement. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome to the stage Chris Hedges and Cornell West. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I think we're going to talk for about 50 minutes. Somebody better keep track of the time, because we won't. Um, uh, on some of the themes that have been prominent in a lot of uh, Cornell's work and that uh, I picked up in the latest book, Wages of Rebellion, uh, The Moral Imperative of Revolt, which came off of three books that I look at as a kind of trilogy, uh, Death of the Liberal Class, which talked about the collapse of liberal institutions, Empire of Illusion, 
the end of literacy and the triumph of spectacle, which talked about that severance from a print-based culture and often a reality-based culture, uh, the degradation of both the intellectual and moral life of modern society. And then the last book, which I did with the great cartoonist Joe Sacco, Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, uh, which is written out of the poorest pockets of the United States, the sacrifice zones, those places that went first in this great predatory campaign of corporate capitalism, where of course now the entire planet has become a sacrifice zone. Uh, Camden, New Jersey, per capita, the poorest city in the United States. Uh, Pine Ridge, South Dakota, where the average life expectancy of a male is 48. That is the lowest in the Western Hemisphere outside of Haiti. At any one time, the people in Pine Ridge, 60% of the people in Pine Ridge have neither electricity or running water. Uh, the coal fields of southern West Virginia, where we are destroying the Appalachian Mountains uh, for coal, uh, poisoning the water, uh, poisoning the air, poisoning the soil, uh, and then the, uh, the produce fields in Florida where you uh, have that long history of slavery going all the way back to the turpentine camps and convict leasing, uh, and you're running into it today, they will uncover uh, slavery. We interviewed people who had been chained at night in trucks. Uh, these are undocumented workers, uh, primarily from Central America and Mexico, and we end with um, Zuccotti Park. Uh, revolt was kind of conjecture when we began the book, and then Zuccotti rose. This book is different. Uh, it, it is not an analysis of uh, contemporary society, the malaise of contemporary society, or particularly a look, although there's an acknowledgement of the corporate coup d'etat that has taken place, as John Ralston Saul says. Uh, it's more about what it means to rebel, uh, the cost of rebellion, uh, the kind of people that rebel, the kinds of conditions that create rebellion, um, and uh, interspersed throughout the book are some, in my mind, some of the great rebels of our time. Uh, Mumia Abu Jamal, who Cornell and I visited up in Frackville, mm. Pennsylvania. Um, Julian Assange, uh, Jeremy Hammond, um, uh, uh, Ronnie uh, Casrils, who founded the armed wing of the ANC with Nelson Mandela. Um, and, uh, and, and it posits that finally in an age of corporate totalitarian extremity, one rebels not for what they finally can achieve, but for who it allows them to become. Uh, that rebellion is uh, a, a, a way to assert and defend and protect and fight for the forces of life in the face of corporate forces of death. Um, and you know, if I sound like a, a, a seminarian, it's because I was one. Um, but but I, I think Cornell would agree that these that this is really the and, and anyone who reads climate change reports uh, will uh, understand the that we're now flirting or more than flirting with the extinction of the species itself and that there's nothing there are no internal impediments of course within corporate capitalism it does what it is designed to do uh, which is to uh, exploit both human capital and the environment until exhaustion or collapse, and now we've lifted all external impediments. Um, and this makes Marx and Cornell, uh, uh, I don't want to speak about Marx in front of Cornell too much, but, uh, but I think Marx was very prescient in terms of oh, understanding absolutely. the final stages absolutely. of capitalism, how capitalism consumes the very structures that sustains capitalism. Uh, and you see it with corporate forces preying on the superstructure of the government, um, you know, whether it's looting of the U.S. Treasury, uh, whether it is uh, cannibalizing budgets, security budgets, 70% of our intelligence is done by uh, for-profit corporations like Bose, Allen, Hamilton, which Snowden used to work for. Um, you know, they want uh, privatizing prisons, corporation infusion into our system of neo-slavery, uh, which is what sustains the prison system, uh, the attempt to privatize public education, uh, I mean hedge fund managers seeking uh, not of course to educate 
poor people of color, uh, but to seize the resources, the some $600 billion a year that we're, we're so we're watching all of that. Um, and all of these forces at this point are uncontrollable. And to stand up to them is an existential choice, in many ways a, a, a form of folly. Most rebels in history do not succeed. Um, uh, and there's a great line from Hannah Arendt who says that, uh, y you know, those who resist in moments of extremity uh, don't ask the question, you know, don't say this oughtn't to be done or this shouldn't be done. They're the people who say, I can't. And, and I'll just end before we mm. begin the discussion with the last chapter. It's Reinhold Niebuhr's concept of sublime yeah. madness, uh, highlighted for me in James Cone's magnificent book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, which you, if, if you have not read, you should better go read. Um, uh, and, and it is this notion that in moments when the order breaks down, liberalism becomes too intellectual, too ineffectual, too weak a force to counter uh, these, these totalitarian, despotic forces uh, that rise up, that, that those who rebel are endowed with this quality of sublime madness. Uh, and I think that's right. And, uh, mm. and Cohn mm. goes back uh, and talks about uh, uh, the, you know, the dark night of, of slavery for African Americans, how uh, you know, they, they had to invert the world's value system um, so that the last become first, uh, so that um, victory is, is, is essentially formed out of defeat. Um, music, of course, is key uh, in terms of the sustenance of the soul. Um, and, and, and the book says, I think, in the end, perhaps the toughest uh, thing for all of us at this moment is to accept the forces that are arrayed against us, not to be blind about their destructive fury and their danger, and yet rise up and resist anyway. Um, and I think that is maybe the way we can begin this conversation. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Definitely. Well, it's always a blessing for me to be on the same stage as my dear brother Chris Hedges. We've spent many, many, many hours together over the years. I consider him one of the grand prophetic figures and voices of our time, especially in a time in which everybody is for sale, everything is for sale, and he refuses to sell his soul for a mess of pottage. That's cutting radically against the grain. I want to thank the nation, I want to thank the new school for facilitating this conversation. And I do want to point out our dear brother Boris Franklin, it's so good to see you. He's our star student of New Jersey. I think Sister Anika Gibbons is here somewhere with her blessed mother. Where is she? Oh, yes, indeed. So good to see both of you all. Assembly so for Brother Kevin Costin. And I think, I think there's Carl Dix here, who's going to be part of Stop Mass Incarceration on October 24th. And Brother Chris wants to be there with us to speak as well two days before there'll be a variety of different actions. You said what? Oh, oh, all right. Well, see the answer to my prayer, but you revolutionary communists, I'm revolutionary Christian, so we got some fascinating tension there, but my prayer was answered. We want Chris there. But I say all that to say is that uh, we live in catastrophic times. We, we know that. Uh, the great Du Bois, who I was told by the very kind dean that uh, he taught at the New School, and he raised those four questions. How shall integrity face oppression? What does honesty do in the face of deception? What does decency do in the face of insult? And how does virtue meet brute force? And the fundamental question of anybody who's concerned about the social misery or socially induced forms of suffering is, what kind of human being are you going to choose to be in your brief trek from your mama's womb to tomb? And it ought to have something to do with integrity, honesty, decency, and virtue. I would go as far as to say, in our society, what is ubiquitous commodification, marketization, commercialization, across the board. If you're fundamentally committed to aspiring to integrity, honesty, decency, and virtue, it already makes you countercultural. <laughs> it already makes you counter-hegemonic. But the challenge is, I come from a tradition of a people that's been traumatized and stigmatized. 
and terrorized for 400 years. And it's still going on this very moment. And in the face of catastrophe, we've tried to sustain a quest for integrity, honesty, decency, and virtue. We all fall short. But Beckett is right. Try again, fail again, fail better. Try again, fail again, fail better before you go to the worms. And it's waiting there for all of us, sooner or later. And that's crucial because the rebels that he talks about in his marvelous text are really wrestling with not just issues of life and death, but how do you learn how to die in order to learn how to live? And the first thing you have to do is break the back of fear. That's the only way you're able to somehow straighten your back up in the face of unbelievable ideological bombardment. It could be patriarchal, imperialist, homophobic, class privilege, class power, all the various forms of structural evil coming at us in the face of ecological catastrophe, nuclear catastrophe, moral catastrophe, economic catastrophe, political cat catastrophe, all functioning simultaneously. So their critiques of capitalism and imperialism are not just PC chit chat buzzwords, but lived realities of people who are both scarred, wounded, but also resisting, also trying to generate some resilience and against overwhelming odds. And that's what comes through so powerfully in Brother Chris's text, this notion of sublime madness. And it's a treatment of um, Reinhold Niebuhr's moral man and immoral society. It's a classic that he wrote as a radicals before he became the darling of the liberal establishment in the 1940s and 50s. But the Ryan Hone Niebuhr of 1932, out of our beloved institution, Union Theological Seminary, and Nika just graduated a couple years ago there, that uh, he talks about sublime madness. I think it's on page 255 and 277. <laughs> Two treatments, but it's fascinating treatment. What goes into the standing up, mm -hmm. straighten your back up, telling the truth, bearing witness, and knowing there's a good chance you're gonna be crushed like a cockroach. And yet people will have to have some memory of the Malcolms and the Martins and the Fannie Lou Hamers and the Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschels and the Edward Zaids. Not as isolated individuals, but as persons who were made by movements and persons who tried to help make movements stronger forces for real good in the language of the great John Coltrane. How does one attempt to do that? Well, that's precisely what this magnificent book is all about. The wages of rebellion, the moral imperative to revolt. And I like that moral because a lot of times leftists don't like to talk about the moral and spiritual grounds and motivations. And if you don't talk about morality and integrity, you're going to be a short distance runner in the struggle for justice. Because a lot of folk come out of the block strong. By the time they get to midlife, they so well adjusted the injustice, they hardly have a memory of what set them on fire when they were in their teens and early 20s. And you have to be a long distance runner to recognize it's a beautiful thing to be on fire for justice. And that's what we have in this marvelous text. So let me begin with a question though, brother. Let me begin with a question. Let's just start on a, on a personal note, though. What goes into the formation of Brother Chris Hedges as a long distance runner for justice? Uh, I, I, I have to go back to, and I, you know, and I, I think, you know, and that would parallel your own life. I have to go back mm. to the way I was raised. Mm. Um, my father was a minister. Uh, he, uh, we lived in a very tiny, a farm town in upstate New York, uh, no people of color. Um, and uh, he supported the civil rights movement at a time when in those rural white enclaves, Martin Luther King was one of the most hated men in America. He had been a sergeant in North Africa. Mm. Uh, he posed the Vietnam War. Um, he, uh, he told me when I was about uh, 12 or 13, that if the war was still being waged when I was 18 and I was drafted, he would go to prison with me. He'd go with you? He'd go, I still have this image of sitting in wow. a jail cell with my dad. For wow. <laughs> uh, and then he, his youngest brother was gay, and my father uh, 
was very, the rest of the family disowned uh, my uncle and, of course, his partner, and, and, except for my dad. And hmm. um, uh, my father had a particular sensitivity for that reason, for the pain of being a gay man in America in the 1950s and 60s, and he became very outspoken about gender equality, gay rights, which uh, ultimately led him uh, to run afoul of the institutional church. Um, they asked him to stop speaking out about this issue. At the time, mm. I was an undergraduate at Colgate. He had a church in Syracuse. Colgate's an hour away. As a matter of fact, when my dad found out that there was no gay uh, GBLT group or gay and lesbian group at Colgate, he brought the gay speakers to co my college. And I would sit around. The, I, I was probably one of the most committed heterosexuals at Colgate, but I would be sitting around. <laughs> And my father kept saying, you have to stand up. You have to come out of the closet. And given the fraternity culture and the football culture and the elitism of Colgate, uh, that's not something wow. they wanted to do. Wow. Um, but it was a problem my dad solved by driving down to Colgate one day, taking me out to lunch and telling me that I had to found the Gay and Lesbian <laughs> Alliance, which I did. I founded it at Colgate. And I would go into the dining hall and the... Uh, uh, checker would take my card and check off the box for breakfast and hand it back and go faggot. Um, and when the church told him he had to stop speaking about this issue, his response was to hold, uh, open his church on Easter for an Easter service for the GBLT community of Syracuse, New York. And he came down and got me and he told me it's probably one of the last times I'll ever hear him preach. And I walked into that church and there, that church was filled with people for whom the institutional church had caused tremendous suffering and pain. I mean, people were crying even before he started. Mm. Uh, and he said, um, sacrament is a marriage, is a sacrament is, uh, uh, a marriage is a sacrament. Uh, it's not a reward for being a heterosexual. And any church that refuses to honor the sacrament of marriage doesn't deserve to call itself Christian. Uh, and he was out. And the last time I saw him, he was working in a windowless basement room as a chaplain in a juvenile detention home. Uh, I was the Balkan Bureau chief for the, the New York Times. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in terms of status and earning power, I had risen, obviously, at that moment far above my dad. But I can remember walking down that hall and realizing what a great, great figure he was. And he gave me you know, that understanding that you're not rewarded for virtue. Virtue itself is its own reward, doing what's right. Standing up and make, making a moral choice has a cost. And if it doesn't have a cost, it's probably not much of a moral choice. And your own life has exemplified this, Cornell. Uh, and you know, just to end, when I was denouncing the call, I'd been the Middle East Bureau Chief for the New York Times, seven years in the Middle East, months of my life in Iraq, and when I was denouncing the call to invade Iraq, uh, I was booed off of a commencement stage in Rockford College, and had my mic cut, and at one point, the most of the 1,000 people stood up and began singing God Bless America to drown me out. Um, and the, my newspaper, the New York Times, issued me a formal written reprimand to stop speaking out about the war. Uh, and that's under guild rules. You give the employee the reprimand in writing. And then when they violate that reprimand again, under guild rules, they can be fired. But I realized, and it wasn't an easy moment, I'd been at the Times for 15 years, nobody wants to lose their job. Um, not only that, I was never, you know, if I didn't stop speaking out, I was never gonna get another job in American journalism again. But I realized as I, I sat in that office uh, that I could muzzle myself and pay fealty to my career. Mm -hmm but to do so would be to betray my father. And I couldn't do that. And when I left, I left the paper, I quit the paper, and when I walked out the door, for the first time I articulated what it was my father who had, had died in 95, what, what it was my father had given me, and that was freedom. That I didn't need the New York Times or anyone else to tell me who I was, I knew who I was, I was my father's son. Ooh. Wow, wow, that's powerful, man.
Oh, that's powerful, though, man. There's something about the power of ancestor appreciation and the connection to those who loved us so mm -hmm. that somehow we still try to put a smile on their faces even when they're in the grave. Todorov calls, calls them the inner witness. That's why history is, you know, you know is so important to know where you came from. That's Absolutely. what August Wilson writes in Joe Turner Come and Gone with the conjurer Joe Loomis who's speaking to African Americans who are coming up from the South still trying to find their families that have been wrenched from them uh, trying to mm -hmm. suffer or deal with the trauma that they've undergone and, and Joe Lewis says, Loomis says you have to find your song, you have to find your song and that, that's what he means by that, your song and, and if you find your song, you're free. And there are all sorts of cultural forces out there that don't want us to find our song. They want historical amnesia. Mm -hmm. They don't want us to connect with all of those great inner witnesses that came before us. You know, whether it's Fannie Lou Hamer or, or Frederick Douglass or oh, yeah. Eugene V. Debs or whoever it is. Dorothy Day. Dorothy yeah. Day. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. God Almighty, brother, it's hard to ask another question after that narrative. <laughs> really, because I mean, it, it, that, that kind of powerful story just needs to sink inside of us and allow us to think in regard to our own prophetic ancestors who sacrificed so much and tried to pass on the best so that their afterlife is at work in our lives. And in a certain sense, we become part of their temporal immortality, uh, that they can live through us, the best of them. Of course, all of us are shot through with contradictions. And of course, you got to choose the right ancestors, because I'm sure <laughs> <laughs> you got some other family members who had some work to do. <laughs> That's true for all of us. That's true for all of us. But let me ask first this intellectual question, because I know that, uh, like it was Jaid, you fell in love with Joseph Conrad. Mm. Uh, you got a son, a wonderful son named Conrad. Uh, uh, and similarly so with Hannah Arendt, and I say that not just because we're at the new school, but because we've talked about that. Hannah Arendt driving down to the, uh, uh, the, the, the Manning. Chelsea Manning's. And uh, exactly, it's, what was, it was the first. When well, he, we went for the, we went for the, uh, we went two or three times, right? We went for the sentencing, we were there for the sentencing. Right. And then we were there for uh, Chelsea Manning's statement oh, yeah, for, for the, the court, powerful statement. right. And long discussions about how Joseph Conrad, Hannah Arendt, as well as uh, Martin Luther King Jr. helped shape and mold who you are. So in addition to that powerful story about family, intellectually, what would be some of the sources and resources you pull from to help sustain your sense of being a rebel driven by deep morality and integrity. I, I think that like you, I draw tremendously from literature mm -hmm. and poetry. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is part of my fear of what's happening to the humanities in universities across the country. Um, you know, when Hannah Arendt writes Origins of Totalitarianism, and she wants to explain the nature of anti-Semitism in France. She quotes Bruce. She said, none of the political theorists captured the nuances and reality of anti-Semitism, the way that what she calls exoticism of Jews within the salons became fashionable, yet was itself a form of racism. And Edward Said writes along in that vein. Um, uh, Conrad is important because, you know, having spent 20 years as a foreign correspondent on the outer reaches of empire, the only intellectual tradition that understand internally that understands empire for me comes out of the black prophetic tradition, because like Jews in Europe. Jewish intellectuals in Europe under fascism, uh, they were, because they were pushed outside the system, they were forced to ask questions 
those who were uh, adopted by the system because of race or religion or whatever don't ask. I think, that's, I think we could make that case with Niebuhr, couldn't we? I think Niebuhr's understanding of imperialism is really naive. I think he gives, you know, he believes that it's a reluctant imperialism and, uh, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so uh, Conrad is an important figure for me because he also understood how empire worked, whether it's in Heart of Darkness mm -hmm. or whether it's Outpost of Progress, that great short story he wrote. Um, he understood the barbarism of modernity. Um, and it's extremely difficult having spent so many years on the outer reaches of empire and coming back to the heart of empire to communicate that reality, especially to a white, you know, a self-satisfied white majority. Uh, because it's not just a matter mm. of describing the crimes of empire. It's about challenging something that's deeply existential um, and that is taught in universities, in schools, in churches, you know, through the entertainment system, through, and that is that we are a virtuous people and God has blessed us above other people and that victory is all we, all of this is a lie when you come back from empire. Um, but it's a lie that most people don't want to see. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so that's why for me, Conrad is important. Arendt, of course, is extremely important. Um, as a moral philosopher, I think Hannah Arendt is, uh, and, and you know, the, both in the case of Arendt and the case of Conrad, they were, they were people of, uh, you know, tremendous intellectual and artistic uh, genius, but they also had life experiences, and we were just talking about Chekhov, mm -hmm. life experiences that allowed them to reach a depth of wisdom and understanding that they're kind of self-satisfied peers who either in the case of Conrad had not been in the Congo or in the place of Aaron had not, uh, and she, she left Heidelberg and joined an underground, she wasn't a Zionist, but she joined an underground Zionist group to allow, to help Jews flee to Palestine. She was picked up in hell for three weeks by the, so she almost didn't make it out. Almost didn't and then it. she's stateless, like Walter Benjamin, like all these other figures. And so, I mean, I think you can go back to Lear on the Heath. It's when you're pushed down to that level and the whole play, King Lear, is about you know, the ability to see. Because what privilege does to you is blind you. And those of us who come out of privilege, if we're going to be intellectually and finally morally effective and honest, it's about ripping away the blinders of privilege. Uh, and uh, and I think also at the same time, you know, I spent much of my life in places like Gaza understanding that as hard as you try, when you come out of a position of privilege as an American, as a male, as a Caucasian, that blindness is never going to go away. That you always mm -hmm. have to mm -hmm. honor, you have to struggle as hard as you can, but then you have to honor the fact that there are things because of where you come from, you will never be able to see. Um, and therefore, you have to listen very closely to, uh, to the voices around you, um, which is why, as a writer and as a journalist, I always consciously put myself in physical spaces of deep oppression. I mean, I began by covering the war in El Salvador, I was there for five years, um, you know, months in Gaza, I was in Sarajevo during the war. Um, I, I teach in a prison for, largely for that reason, so I don't lose that connection because I don't want to lose, I, I need to be, I need to be, I, I need to constantly be checked. I need mm. to constantly mm. listen, but that's Conrad, mm. I think that's why Conrad's so important to me, yeah even given all of the ambivalences and some of the blindnesses in Conrad himself, he has the courage to confront the issues right. of what empire really means. Um, you know, what's striking about uh, your corpus for me in part, it's very rare to find white intellectuals who are willing to hit head on the vicious legacy of white supremacy. 
you can almost count them on your hand. Eric Foner, Stanley Aronowitz, Muriel Rookkaiser, Miles Horton. It's not a long list of very important leftist white intellectuals who really understand how central and integral the vicious legacy of white supremacy has been in the shaping of the U.S. empire. And anybody who begins with America's original sin is slavery, they already got it wrong. You know, they're on the wrong foot. They have nothing to say about indigenous peoples, nothing to say about the land taken, nothing to say about dispossession, nothing to say about violation, let alone genocidal effect with disease and attacks coming together. So they already got it wrong, you see. And yet at the same time, it's true that the enslavement of dignified African peoples has been so much at the center of the development of the American empire and how it then connects to the arrival of white ethnics coming out of impoverished Europe or Jew-hating Europe or whatever it is. How do you account for that given, I mean, your father is pre-Stonewall, but already committed to the humanity and decency of lesbian, gays, bisexuals, and trans and so forth. But in your work, white supremacy is always right there at the center. Well, because when I finished college, largely because of William Stringfellow, who I had read religiously in college, who's a, Stringfellow was a uh, white graduate from Harvard, Bates College, Harvard yes. Law School, and yes. went to Harlem in the 50s. That's right. So before, at least for white America, race oppression was even on the radar. And he wrote these very powerful texts, mm -hmm. My People the Enemy, yes, yes. Um, which were more than an account of the reality of racism, but a meditation on the systems of power that created it from a theological perspective. When Karl Barth came to Union, and they asked him which theologian he wanted to meet. He said Stringfellow. Well, of course, Union never, never invited William Stringfellow, even though he was right down the street. Um, so Stringfellow, and you know the other book was very important to me, was The Brothers Karamazov, which I had read three times in college. And those so two books. Ask, in relation to white supremacy? Well, just in terms break of. Break that down, in, in, break that down, bro. <laughs> No, I think, it was, I think it was in terms of putting yourself in a, in a marginal community. Oh, Alyosha. the empathetic imagination right. to put yourself right. in the, the shoes and of others. And so yes. I moved to Roxbury, yes. yeah. and I lived in Roxbury oh, gotcha. for two and a half years and ran a small church there, and I had come from a farm community. I had been gone to a boarding school as a scholarship student, but I'd never lived in the city, never, certainly never lived in the inner city, and I was just devastated at... Uh, you know, the warehousing of human beings, what we were doing to children. Um, I, uh, it was, you know, I remember you once asking me, even though I've covered all sorts of wars, what the most kind of formative experience was, and it was that two and a half years, kind of, because it really opened my eyes to how uh, institutions work to keep the poor poor. Mm -hmm. The banks, mm -hmm. the schools, mm -hmm. the probation officers, the police, all everything conspires to hem the poor in like sheep. So you have these invisible walls that of course are matched by the very physical walls of prison, but on the outside you don't see those walls. It's only when you're trapped within those walls that you see them. Uh, and commuting every day into Cambridge to go to Harvard Divinity School was very schizophrenic, mm -hmm. where you know you would sit around with people on Francis Avenue who would talk about empowering people they never met. Um, you know, they all liked the poor, but they didn't like the smell of the poor. Uh, and and it was going back. You know, I, I live there. I didn't. Um, I remember I, I was just, the, the projects, this was Mission May, Mission Extension Housing Projects, which at the time were probably the worst in Boston, 60, 40 or 60 percent vacancy, all the locks were off the doors, the corridors were unlit, um, and I went back to Colgate to my great mentor, Coleman Brown, uh, who had been uh, with 
Bill Weber and East mm -hmm. Harlem, had gone to Union, mm -hmm. and then had worked in the inner city in Chicago for many years. And founder of the Sing Sing MA program. Which yeah. Many of us talked for many That's years. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. I, I just walked into his office and I said, are we created to suffer? And he said, is there any love that isn't? Um, and I think that that's when I began to understand the n tragic nature of destiny, the, what it meant, as James Cone writes, to carry the cross, what that means, mm -hmm. um, that it's lonely, that it's painful, yes. that yeah. it hurts, yeah. uh, that you're often reviled for it. I mean, look at our great prophets like Malcolm or like King. At the end of their lives, they were utterly alone. We forget that now. Yeah. King was, you know, they were deserting in droves. Oh, no doubt about it. And same with Malcolm. Very lonely figures because they held fast. And, and in the whole rise of that black power movement, there was a moment where King went to the retreat center, what was it called, uh, that Horton had set up? Highlander. Uh, right. Yes. And, and, and his movement is disintegrating around him. And he says, he stands up and he says, I take nonviolence to be my lawfully wedded wife. You know, in yeah. sickness and in health. And, um, and I think I began perhaps to have a consciousness of the cost the cost and, um, and, and, and that if one was going to, as a writer, and I went from Roxbury to Central America, from Central America to the Middle East, from the Middle East to Yugoslavia, if one is going to accept that cost, um, there's a kind of tragic destiny, a kind of understanding that uh, in many ways, at least in an empirical sense, everything you do in some ways, at least in the grand sort of scheme of life, is futile. But that doesn't make it meaningless. Um, that, uh, that, that resistance is, you know, honest resistance is about, you know, as Auden says, holding up that ironic point of light mm -hmm that flashes out wherever the just exchange their messages, um, and that even when one stands up, uh, it, it, and even if it appears that no one around them is listening, that capacity to physically embody a narrative of justice is never lost. I mean, D Daniel Berrigan, uh, another great influence, said that faith for him is the good joint, the belief that the good draws to it the good. That, you know, or at least the good insofar as we can determine it. Um, the Buddhists call it karma. Uh, but then we have to let it go. And so I was, I saw that in Prague when I covered the Velvet Revolution. I was in the Magic Lantern Theater every night with Václav Havel and Klaus and Dinsbeer and all these figures who would inherit the government with the fall of the communist regime. And all through the streets of Prague that winter were posters of a Charles University student, Jan Pollock, who had lit himself on fire in 1968 in Wenceslas Square to protest the Soviet invasion, the overthrowing of Dubček. He died four days later of his burns. Uh, it was a non-event in the state media, like so much of the, the lethal killings and tragedies are non-events to our own corporate media. Uh, the Charles University students carried his body, his coffin, to the cemetery. Uh, it was broken up by the police. When his grave became a shrine, um, uh, they, the communist authorities exhumed the remains, cremated them, gave the ashes to his mother and said she couldn't bury them. His poster was all up and down the streets of Prague two weeks after the government fell. 10,000 Czechs marched to Red Army Square and renamed it Jan Pollock Square. Mm. I was mm. in Wenceslas Square with a, about a half million Czechs, December, snowing, and the great singer Marta Kubasheva, who 
uh, when the Soviets had invaded, on the radio had sung a song called A Prayer for Marta, an anthem of defiance. In retaliation, her recording stock was destroyed. Uh, she was banned from the airwaves. She had spent the intervening years working on an assembly line in a toy factory. And I was, watched her walk out on that balcony and begin to sing the prayer for Marta. And every Czech in that crowd knew every word. Mm. That's the mm. power of resistance. That's the moral power of resistance, the capacity to stand up and as Václav Havel says in his great 1978 essay, the power of the powerless to speak the truth. Not to power, about power. And for whatever reason, at particular moment, people are afraid or people, you know, have to get that paycheck in, or, but they hear it. They do hear it. I believe they hear it. And, and, and I think it's that belief, that idea that the good draws to it the good which I can't empirically justify. Um, which is a form of faith. I think it's life a, of resistance a is a form of faith. of faith. I mean, you often talk about, yeah. you know, Jesus was killed as an insurrectionist. Well, he died a political criminal. He died a by the most vicious empire of its day, yeah. the Roman Empire, very much like the American Empire of our own day. Let's talk about contemporary American Empire. Uh, we just saw the, uh, the neoliberal triumphalism last night of uh, Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Not a lot to talk about empire. You didn't hear anything about innocent people, U.S. drones dropping bombs on the babies. We didn't hear anything about Israeli occupation. We didn't hear anything about what's going on in Latin America. We heard some decent things about Wall Street from Brother Bernie. I mean, that's fine. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, um, but we, did, we didn't hear about democratic complicity in all of that. Well, it, exactly. And intellectual complicity yeah. and the mass media complicity and the culture industry complicity and the academic complicity as well. <laughs> Give us some sense of where we are now in light of these magnificent individuals and movements that you lay bare in this wonderful text that you've done. Well, we lost our movements. Um, they were eviscerated in the name of anti-communism. Mm. Our greatest resistance figures and intellectuals W.E.B. Du Bois, were turned into pariahs. How old was Du Bois? He was handcuffed. He was... February 13th, 1951. He was born on February 23rd, 1868. So that means he was 83 in, years old. He had 12 years of labor, died at 95. He's handcuffed. One visitor at 31 Court Street, Brooklyn Heights, in the greatest borough in the world, Brooklyn. That's Du Bois, and that one visitor was the most popular Negro in the world in 1939, but he's under house arrest in Philadelphia, named Paul Robeson. And thank God Harry Belafonte and William Attaway and Oliver Killens and a few others had access to Du Bois with his magnificent wife, Shirley Graham Du Bois. But here, this towering figure under surveillance, under government, subordination in a certain sense, even though he was not incarcerated. But uh, uh, the quote that I, uh, that I put forward, 1957, was the first novel in the trilogy. This is his love letter to the younger generation called The Ordeal of Manzart. Uh, it was precisely his wrestling with what kind of life have I lived? Can I pass it on to the next generation? Because people have forgotten my name. Mm historical erasure, which is one of the ways in which you ensure that integrity is not vital if memory is erased. Because you can't have that ancestor appreciation. You can't have that wind at your back, as it were. Uh, uh, so I, I, I hear exactly what you're saying in terms of our present day. And yet, you know, we live in the age of Ferguson. And that's a beautiful thing. That marvelous militancy among the younger generation puts a smile on my face because they're hungry and thirsty for not just the memory, but for, for the enactment and embodiment of courageous thought, courageous action, and willingness to stand in the face of overwhelming, odds. highly militarized police departments, facilitated by who? Neoliberals, 
Obama and Republicans together. Very much like the imperial policy. And they get all upset. How come Ferguson looks like Baghdad? You voted for it. You remember? <laughs> you remember? Yes. You, how come the crime bill? Who voted for it? That was Bill Clinton. Well, for who, that was Bill Clinton. Oh, yes, we remember. How come the banks are doing the same with greed? You deregulated. You the one who repealed Glass-Steagall. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? The level of hypocrisy and the way in which the mendacity hides and conceals the criminality. And that's very much what we're talking about. Forms of criminality. In our neoliberal regime, forms of criminality have become so normalized and become so routinized. That's why Wall Street executives, how many went to jail given their insider trading, market manipulation, fraudulent activity, predatory lending? Not one. No, Bernie Madoff, but that's because he stole from rich people. <laughs> well, that, yeah, that's, yeah that's, that's, that's a good point. <laughs> that's a good point, but you can see how, how skewed the, uh, and how viciously classist and racist the criminal justice system is in terms of who actually goes. Mm. Let Jamal Latisha get caught with a crack bag off to jail, you see. Bring in Eric Holder, his best friends. He's got to persecute them. He refuses to do it. And he goes right back to Wall Street where he is right now. Right. Cuffington and Weiss. Bring you see. back Glass-Steagall. Well, that would be a nice step. But we need more than that, my dear sister. But yes, that's a good thing. I agree. That would be a very, very important step. I mean, but where are we now in terms of the need for rebellious spirit, courageous thought and action to somehow keep track of the criminality and mendacity that is so pervasive these days. Once any cabal, whether it's military, oligarchic, monarchic, seizes power totally, it engenders political paralysis. Mm. I watched mm. this in Yugoslavia. In essence, uh, you have which we have with the Democratic Party, figures like Clinton and Obama, um, a, a self-identified liberalism that is a faux liberalism. So it speaks in the traditional feel your pain language of liberalism, but assiduously mm. serves the interests of that oligarchic corporate cabal. Mm. And that means that the government is thrown into crisis because it is unable to respond to the rights, grievances, injustices, most basic needs of the citizenry. And all of that is getting worse in the name of austerity. Um, the most dangerous institution in America is the war industry and the military. They are doing what in late empires these forces always do, which is expand beyond the capacity of empire to sustain imperialism and military adventurism. Uh, officially, we spend a little less than 54% mm. of discretionary spending on the military, but that masks all sorts of other spending, veterans affairs, nuclear weapons, and the whole black budgets, especially the intelligence budgets that we're not allowed to see. Mm -hmm. By some estimates, we're spending up to $1.6 trillion a year on war, and, and, and total war, which was imposed upon us by the corporatists after World War II, who, who conspired with militarists, not only for profit, but to make war on those social movements that had both a political and an economic agenda. And so the country is disemboweled physically, our infrastructure is crumbling, yeah. uh, our unemployment yeah. figures are uh, completely fictitious. I think the LA Times last year ran a story saying that in real terms, we probably have at least 17% unemployment, and that doesn't count underemployment. So the average worker at Walmart works 28 hours a week, the salary puts them below the poverty line, and they get applications for food stamps courtesy of the Walton family, which makes $11,000 an hour, uh, so they can subsidize mm -hmm. their greed. Um, and the creation of that system 
you know, because we have been rent, because money has replaced the vote, uh, because uh, you know, we essentially have been rendered powerless. It doesn't matter what we want. I mean, nobody wanted the bailouts of 2008. Constituent calls were 100 to 1 against those bailouts. Across the political spectrum, they pass anyway. Nobody wants wholesale surveillance. Nobody wants all of their private and personal information uh, captured by the government and stored in perpetuity in government. Nobody wants it. Nobody wanted, as you came and sat with me, when we sued Barack Obama in federal court over Section 1021 of the National mm. Defense Authorization Act. Mm -hmm. uh, he should be impeached. Uh, uh, and, and so uh, this was a Section 1021 allowed the, uh, permits the U.S. military to, in times of crisis, carry out domestic policing, overturning over 150 years of domestic law to seize U.S. citizens who quote unquote substantially support that's not material support, that's not a legal term. Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or associated forces, another mm -hmm. nebulous term, strip them of due process and hold them indefinitely in military detention facilities. In that two year, pro we won in the Southern District Court of New York, Obama challenged it. Uh, it. The appellate court unfortunately denied our standing. We didn't manage to get to the Supreme Court in this law. But when they ran an opinion poll uh, in the course of that two year legal battle, that had a 97% disapproval rating but it passed anyway. We see over and over examples of how what we are concerned about, and a couple of Princeton professors just statistically sort of quantified all this, it doesn't matter. And what that does is create a system like Yugoslavia where you, uh, that paralysis, that political paralysis builds deep and understandable frustration. We're watching, you know, what uh, severe repression and an inability to deal with the most elemental forms of justice are doing right now in Palestine and Israel. And, uh, and that Netanyahu neoliberal agenda is one that is intimately twinned with our own. So what happens is as the, the, the state, in essence, is deconstructed mm -hmm. by these corporate capitalist forces quite physically, mm -hmm. they bring back, this is what always happens, they bring back from the outer reaches of empire, the forms of control that are intimately familiar to those we subjugate. Empire subjugates drones, militarized police, wholesale surveillance. So you take a night raid in East New York where they're kicking down the door in Kevlar vests, dressed in black with long-barreled weapons for a nonviolent drug offense, terrorize an entire family. It looks no different than a night raid in Fallujah. And that, that's what happens when empires die. The harsh, brutal, violent forms of control that empire has perfected on what Franz Fanon calls the wretched of the earth soon become intimately familiar in the heart of empire itself. And this is, gets into the whole issue of what we have done in marginal communities where we have allowed omnipotent policing. Hannah Arendt writes about that as well omnipotent policing, and she writes about it vis-a-vis -vis the stateless, but she says as soon as you create a legal and a physical mechanism for omnipotent policing, i.e. unarmed civilians can be shot dead or strangled to death on city sidewalks or for having never committed a crime and the police go free. Once you create a mechanism whereby your police serve as they do in our, uh, in our poor communities as judge, jury, and executioner, then the moment the society unravels, everything's in place to put both that legal and physical mechanism as a, as a way of maintaining control. Thucydides writes mm -hmm. about it, you know, with Athens expanding empire, Thucydides writes, the tyranny that Athens imposed on others, it finally imposed on itself, and that's what killed Athenian democracy. And that's what's killed American democracy. So you talk about Black Lives Matter, uh, the anti-fracking movement, uh, mm. the struggle to raise uh, minimum, that's where hope comes from. Um, it's not going to come from the political vaudeville of elections. Um, as Emma Goldman said, if elections were that effective, they'd be illegal. Um, uh, it, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to come as it always comes from the bottom up. We forget that. That's Zinn's great contribution. Howard, Howard in, Zinn. In, yes. in, in the people's history of the United States. He understood mm. the system was designed to shut us out. Slaveholding, white, aristocratic, 
oligarchs who openly embraced genocide against Native Americans on behalf of land speculators, timber merchants, railroad companies, gold mining concerns, uh, who shut out women, uh, Native Americans, African Americans, men without property, created a Senate where everybody was appointed, created the Electoral College because they were terrified of popular democracy. That's how Gore wins half a million more votes than George W. Bush and George W. Bush is president. It had nothing to do with Nader, by the way. And, uh, and Gore's refusal to fight. And his refusal to fight. And so Zinn's, in that, the beauty of that book is that all of the openings in American democracy were created by movements that often paid for it in blood. We had the bloodiest labor wars of any industrialized oh, world. Yes. Hundreds of American workers were murdered. Thousands, tens of thousands were blacklisted. Uh, and uh, the Liberty Party, the abolitionists, uh, the suffragists, none of these movements achieved power. But they created pressure mm -hmm. on the centers of power so that power had to respond. And that gets to yeah. Karl Popper, who in the first volume of The Open Society Its Enemies says, the question is not how do you get good people to rule? That's the wrong question. The question is how do you make the power elite frightened of you? Most people attracted to power, Popper writes, are at best mediocre or venal. And that's what we've forgotten, that it, those of us who hold fast to justice, it's not our job to take power. It's our job to make power frightened of us. That's what created the New Deal, and Roosevelt's quite open about it in his letters. Roosevelt says, he, he even says in a 1930 letter, if we don't uh, create social reforms, we're going to have a revolution. He says to his fellow oligarchs, you better give up some of your money now, or you might lose all of your money. And that's how we got... Mm -hmm. 15 million jobs, the public works program, social security. And even those are concessions. They were all concessions. Yes, they were, and Roosevelt concessions. says. Significant concessions. But he says his greatest achievement was that he saved capitalism. And the, we have to recover those movements. And I see that in Black Lives Matter, in the anti-fracking movement, in all of these groups are not getting any kind of media coverage. I just, and the BDS movement. We are going to bring down Israeli apartheid college by college, church by church, institution by institution. That's how it's going to come. I know it's getting late. We're going to open it up for, for questions. How are we doing with time, though, no. Sister Dean? You say what? Oh, okay, we better go to questions. Yeah, okay, because I could stay for hours. You know? We have well, stayed for I, hours. Oh, that's the truth. <laughs> we want to be kind to you all. Absolutely. Can you hear me? Is it up? No. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let's, here's the first one. How seismic is it that we now have a popular socialist, Bernie Sanders, running for president and talking about the need for revolution? Well, one is I do think it's important that there always has to be some connection between the perception of catastrophic conditions and the emergence of a courageous and visionary imagination and praxis that calls for some kind of revolution. Brother Bernie's calling for a political revolution. Now, we need more than that. But he's calling for a political revolution in terms of getting big money out of politics, in terms of breaking up the banks, in terms of free education and single payer health care. Now, given how far America's moved to the right, that makes Bernie Sanders look as if he's damn near communist in the eyes of many of our fellow citizens. But all that is, of course, is just social democratic policies that ought to be commonsensical when you got 1% of the population owning 42% of the wealth, when you got 40% of children of color living in poverty, when you got levels of massive unemployment and underemployment, when you got decrepit educational systems generating soul murder every day in the lives of precious poor children, and when you got indecent housing and infrastructure collapsing. That's just social democratic policy. So his political revolution is actually still reformist, but he's using the language of revolution that I like very much. 
as a revolutionary Christian because I think things need to just turn around and be turned over. Uh, so, so, so that on the one hand, that's a, a nice move in the right direction. On the other hand, we have to analyze precisely what he means by the term. Last night, for example, they talked about socialist. Bernie is a socialist. They hadn't really talked about him as a socialist that much. Now, every time they refer to him as socialist, what they mean is red baiting. But what is actually the case is he's a social democrat. A democratic socialist begins with a critique of the workplace, begins with workers' control vis-a-vis -vis the bosses. It begins with an attempt to ensure that the voices of ordinary people is heard in every institution, not just electoral political context. Now, he has a rich history as a democratic socialist, and that's, that's wonderful, it's unprecedented in some ways. We've got to go back to Norman Thomas and Eugene Debs for that. Or Martin Luther King Jr., of course, who understood himself as a democratic socialist. But uh, I think it's a sign of hope. That's why I'm, I'm critically supporting my dear Bernie Sanders. I'm going to push him as far as I can uh, because of the decadence of the electoral political system we find ourselves in. When you're dealing with legalized bribery and normalized corruption, which is basically what American politics has become, and you get somebody with integrity, because at least he's got integrity, that's very important. As I mentioned before, just sheer honesty. I mean, everybody's wondering, God, he treated Hillary Clinton like a human being. That is so extraordinary. <laughs> oh, wow. He's just a decent Brooklyn Jewish brother. I mean, yeah, hey, that's fine. That's fine. But we got to put a lot of pressure on Brother Bernie in regard to foreign policy, in regard to empire, in terms of workplace democracy, and a lot of other things, those of us who are democratic socialists. But at the same time, we ought to make sure that, uh, that he's treated fairly because I think he's been marginalized and in some ways mistreated by the mm -hmm. corporate media. I mean, the power of Bernie Sanders is that yeah. he speaks in a language that describes our reality. And that's kind of yeah. an, a window into how impoverished political Wait, discourse has that's true. come, that it's that's so true. amazing that he recognizes that there's inequality and corruption. Uh, that's right. Uh, and <laughs> that's, that's right. Absolutely. You know, the, the, the brilliance of Bill Clinton was that he transformed the Democratic Party into the Republican Party, and he pushed the Republican Party so far to the right it became insane. Um, my problem with Sanders, aside from the Palestine issue, um, uh, and I'm, you know, I, is the fact that unlike Debs, mm -hmm. he won't challenge the war industry and imperialism. And if we don't break the back of imperialism, and that military corporatist complex, because look, nobody's sitting around general dynamics hoping peace breaks out in the Middle East. Uh, every mm. uh, Tomahawk cruise missile costs $1.41 million, and in a couple days we dropped 160 of them on Libya. That's half a billion dollars these guys made. A war is a business. Uh, that's what I learned as a war correspondent. And, uh, and you know, it used to be that the old Democratic Party, when it had a liberal wing, would challenge weapons yeah. systems. We just, yeah. the, 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 the contractors come in, at, like with the F-22 Raptors, uh, uh, the fighter planes, even the Pentagon said, we don't need them, we don't, they don't, they build them anyway. Uh, we just authorized eight Ohio-class nuclear submarines at, I can't remember, like $12 billion, $8 billion a piece. Uh, it's insane. Uh, and. Uh, it's, it's completely out of control, and um, that's going to be tough because if we don't, you know, you cannot be a socialist unless you are an anti-militarist and an anti-imperialist. Right Very important. Very important. So here's a second question. Um, a recently published textbook referred to the slave trade as a migration. Your thoughts? And uh, as a follow-up, how do we ensure that the truth and uh, the truth of our, our, our history and our story is told? It's always intellectual conflict, always a hermeneutical contestation. It's a fight of interpretation. Uh, you know, uh, you're going to get all kind of deodorized language. That, that's more than deodorized. They just need to get off the symbolic crack pipe and get a sense of reality. <laughs> But I mean, these lies that go on and on, even just calling Jim Crow discrimination is so deodorized. It was American terrorism, it was tied to lynching, it was tied to a hatred and a hunting and a haunting of a people. 
And we have to be able to be honest about this so that the legacy of white supremacy is not just racist discrimination. <laughs> the Irish and the Catholics had ugly discrimination. Jewish brothers and sisters had vicious discrimination. It wasn't the same as being terrorized every day in an apartheid-like section of a U.S. empire. Difference between race and ethnicity, even though discrimination is real, it's ugly, and so forth and so on, you see. And so it's just truth-telling. And I mentioned you know, some of the historians. We've had some great breakthroughs in this regard. I mentioned Brother Fona, Eric Fona. I can't say enough about that brother in terms of the truth-telling that he's done as an American historian. He hasn't done it alone. Nell Payne and a host of others have also done that. But how do we make that widely available, especially in textbooks and not just in Texas? But you can start there. <laughs> a whole lot of mendacity in those textbooks that have wide distribution. But it's very difficult for America to come to terms with the truth uh, of its own past and present. Well, you've also spoken about how even when they hold up a great revolutionary figure like King, he becomes completely yes. sent. He gets frozen Absolutely. in time Absolutely. in the I Have a Dream speech, and Absolutely. that's your book, Absolutely. The Radical King. Absolutely. Just get Santa Clausified. <laughs> Santa Claus smile on his face, toys in his bag, everybody loved him, that's a lie. And it's not just white brothers and sisters, 72% of white Americans disapprove of Martin when he killed, 55% of black people disapproved of Martin King when he was shot. Couldn't speak in churches. We don't want that echo of Radio Hanoi following the New York Times, Times Magazine, and Newsweek after he gave his famous speech at Riverside. The black folk got afraid, got intimidated. We don't want to get too close. He's unpatriotic. He's critical of the American military killing machine and so forth and so on. And this is crucial in our own present moment as well, even in relation to uh, uh, various progressive forces, be it marches that we're going to have on October 24th, or be it even Bernie Sanders in the electoral political arena. All the black folk at the moment all hovering around Hillary Clinton again. You say, oh my God, first time tragedy, second time farce. <laughs> but who's leading the way? Well, it's the black professional class. They got some real interest in this. What is their relation to the black poor and the black working class? Everybody knows if black upper class kids were going to prison at the same level of the black poor kids, we'd have different kind of black leadership. Class is real. Class is very, very real, and we can see it more and more. I mean, I think Mar Malcolm would have called it the niggerization of the black professional class, where you get more money, more position, more access to power, more status, but you're still scared, intimidated, and afraid. And when you niggerize the people, you keep them scared and intimidated so they don't want to know the truth, and they walk around deferential to the powers that be. And that's very, very real. But once you break the back of fear, back to Ferguson, back to Baltimore, back to Staten Island, and we got a young generation who understand more and more class experientially, they know that the black professional class, the black political class does not represent them. They know that. They know the levels of being well adjusted to injustice and well adapted to indifference is pervasive among our professional and political class, no matter what color. They turn their backs on the poor and working people, you see. And where do they go? Well, that's an open question. Well, that's why Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton and Brother were Sharpton booed and others out of booed Ferguson. Booed in Ferguson, absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> definitely, because they, they could see that, oh my God, here comes those addicted to the camera once again. We want the real thing. What was the real thing? It's not going to be any black professional figure for the most part. It's gonna come from the people themselves. We're gonna dish out our own leaders, our own voices. And those who wanna join can join, but we're gonna dish out our own leaders. It's gonna be organic, it's gonna be indigenous. This question is for Chris, actually. Uh, the Republican Party is going through severe fracturing and severe crisis of leadership. You've spent long amounts of time observing the decaying power struggles, structures, sorry. Uh, do you believe the party will move toward modernization or will it continue to give us mediocre demagogues like Trump, Cruz, et cetera? Mediocre, that's kind. 
<laughs> I was in Montgomery with the great uh, civil rights attorney Brian Stevenson, who spent his life defending uh, prisoners on death row, most of whom, of course, are black and poor. And we were walking through Montgomery, and he was pointing out to me all of the Confederate memorials that had been put up. And he said they've all been put up in, like in the last 10 years, including when you actually drive into Montgomery on the outskirts, there is a gigantic Confederate flag. Half of Montgomery is black. It's where King started his ministry. It's where Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat. And I said to Brian, it reminds me of Yugoslavia, that with the economic disintegration of Yugoslavia, and this we can go back to Weimar, mm -hmm. people retreated into mythical narratives about themselves. Uh, and that's how you vomited up these figures like Rada von Karadich, who is really Donald Trump. Karadich was a figure of ridicule. Um, uh, but the frustration and anger with an ineffectual liberal class um, uh, empowered these buffoonish, but once in power, very dangerous figures. And what I see in the Republican Party mm. is precisely this phenomena. Mm -hmm. You can't have a rational discussion with uh, somebody who thinks that the Confederacy was about protecting Southern womenhood and Christian values. Uh, you can't have a rational discussion with a Christo-fascist who believes in creationism. And uh, these are strong, these strong proto-fascist forces, which are evidence in the nativism, the overt racism, uh, uh, are, are on display in the Republican Party. And what do fascist movements do? They channel a legitimate rage towards the vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Undocumented workers, African Americans, uh, homosexuals, intellectuals, liberals, feminists. And that's what we're witnessing. And it's counterintuitive. You know, I've long worked with Ralph Nader um, because, like Ralph, I believed that those of us who cared about progressive values at a certain point had to draw a line and take a stand. And the danger with not doing that is that we have figures like Obama. I mean, the Democratic Party in Europe would be a far-right party. Uh, Obama's assault on civil liberties has been worse than Bush's. And, uh, the, 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 what happens in a moment of turmoil, whether it's an economic crisis, and we're certainly headed towards another one, courtesy of Wall Street, uh, an environmental crisis, which the fossil fuel industry is doing its best to engender, mm -hmm. means that mm -hmm. in a moment of breakdown, um, these forces are given a kind of frightening virulence. And America is a very, very, very violent culture, oh, yeah. as oh, yeah. it was Hofstetter's great book on violence. Last book, American Violence. Yes, the Conversations book. with Cornell are him mentioning books I haven't read and me running out to read them, including the one I have on Chekhov in the background. Um, but it was that Hofstetter book yeah, on violence. The great where, Hofstetter. Yeah, yeah. W w that, that form of vigilante violence, which goes right back to the slave patrols, That's right. the Klan, the Baldwin Felts, the Pinkertons, the gun thugs, the militias, the Tea Party. It's a complete continuity. And... Um, you know, our backlash for that reason may be, especially with the evisceration of progressive and populist movements, may be a very frightening right-wing backlash. And you know, don't forget that in, in the 19, early 1930s, everyone thought the Nazis were a joke. The same kind of buffoonery, idiocy, um, uh, that you see in a figure like Trump or Cruz or any of these other. And, and I find it, I, you know, it's amusing until they get power, and then it's very frightening. Absolutely. I mean, a certain sign of hope is, and I don't want to be too generational here, but if the election were held this very moment, and the only American citizens who could vote were under 30, Bernie Sanders would win. If the election were held today, and the only people who could vote were over 65, 
Bernie would almost win. Something happened generationally during the ice age of the neoliberal epoch <laughs> with the formation of a self, a sense of what it is to live in America that moved folk tied to a certain callousness and indifference. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel was right. Indifference to evil is more evil than evil itself because it generates ways of life that make you think that to be in the world is to be indifferent and callous to other people's suffering, especially the weak, the vulnerable, the orphan, the widow, the fatherless, the motherless, the poor. And so generationally speaking, there is a certain dynamic going on here. And those are at least signs of hope, of help, of hope for me, even though I, I'm no optimist, as you know. I don't believe in optimism, but I'm a prisoner of hope. That's qualitatively different. <laughs> And I think this is going to be uh, the last question uh, that we have time for today. Um, how do we best connect people of disparate struggles uh, so that we can stand up together and overcome? I'll answer that very briefly and let you get this last word. One is that I think um, the wonderful line in Kant's Critique of Pure Reason where he says examples are the go card of judgment, that people would rather see sermons than hear sermons. And it's only by example, it's only by living a certain kind of life tied to a certain kind of community with a grand vision that embraces all of humanity, if not all of sentient beings, that a sense of the good becomes contagious. That's the only thing that we dysfunctional species that we are in space and time have in the face of Egoism, narcissism, tribalism, hatred, envy, revenge, resentment. Those are the dominant tendencies of our history as a species. And how do you break the cycle of the hatred, the oppression, the domination, the resentment, the revenge, and so forth? It's by examples of people who are profoundly motivated with a deep sense of love of something beyond themselves beyond their families, beyond their tribes, beyond their clans. That's what democracy is, the moral ascension toward an embrace of something beyond just your own individual, or your own family, or your own tribe. You see, and how do you do that? Well, we used to call it education. <laughs> but now it's just schooling, that's tied to the market. Education, something else. I know new schools into education, so we won't get into that now. But the point is, <laughs> Education is about that turning of the self to things that matter. It's about a cultivation and a maturation of who you are that connects you to community so that you're willing to be courageous and compassionate before the worms get you. That's, in the end, all we have as a species. Commitment to truth, justice, love of neighbor in the broad sense. And how good are we at it? Depends on which historical moment you invoke. During the Ice Age, marginal voices, like Brother Chris has been during the neoliberal epoch. When things start melting and the masses get frenetic and energetic and enthusiastic, they're ready to straighten their backs. But then the question is, will their rage be channeled through love and justice or hatred and revenge? That's the fundamental question. That's Martin King's question. That's Curtis Mayfield's question. That's Donnie Hathaway's question. That's the question that my people, black folk, have been wrestling with for 400 years. In the face of catastrophe, we keep dishing out love warriors, like Toni Morrison, like James Baldwin, like Martin, like Fannie Lou, like Stevie Wonder. Love warriors, I hated people still dishing out love warriors of truth and justice. How long will that last? We don't know. But once it begins to run out of gas, you can rest be assured America will go fascist. Because that's been the leaven in the loaf in the history of this nation. The love warriors coming out of one of the most hated groups in the history of this nation mm -hmm. and the modern world. And it's not because black people have a monopoly on truth or goodness or beauty, 
but because they decided to be love warriors in the face of unbelievable terror and trauma and stigma. How long that will last, we don't know. Open question. At this time, uh, oh no, he got the last word. Oh, <laughs> no, he got last word. I'll just say something quickly, and I and I and I think I can speak for Cornell as well. Uh, I don't think it's accidental that both of us come out of a deep religious tradition and a deep religious orientation, not an orthodox one. Um, what Graham Greene said, he was a Christian agnostic. Um, but I think it is finally yeah. that capacity for reverence yeah. of life, yes. the understanding that which all religions have at their core that it's not about us, That's right. it's about our brothers and sisters, and in particular the stranger and the outcast. That's right. It's about the, the, the quality of our life is measured by the, our capacity for empathy, especially for those who are different, that all of these are spiritual values that, of course, in a modern consumer, neoliberal, imperialist society uh, ha have attempted to be snuffed out with the primacy of the cult of the self and hedonism right. and the celebration of power and violence. And I think we have to recover that capacity for faith, and I say that to people, you know, of a creed or without a creed. Uh, you know, certainly many of the figures we, had, if you want to call them spiritual figures that we admire most, Chekhov, uh, Baldwin, who, who, as he said, left the church to preach the gospel. Beckett oh, yes, did not, yeah. had a great animus towards institutional religion, and yet they grappled with that reality of uh, transcendence and Harold Goddard another book oh, you had yes. me read which yeah. I quote at the end of this book uh, you know that it finally it comes down what it, for, to what he calls the human imagination Nation. and by that he means the ability to put yourself in the place of another to feel what another feels and to sacrifice for the other um, and let's go back to the point that the great theologian James Cone makes when he talks about bearing the cross and Garrow's great biography of oh, King yeah. is called bearing, bearing the, the cross. cross. And it, that doesn't mean that you have to come at it from a Christian perspective. I spent seven years in the Middle East. Uh, people of tremendous probity who fight on behalf of the oppressed and stand up to the oppressor arise in every culture and every religion. That's right. That's and, right. uh, and they are my my brothers and my sisters, and some of them arise out of belief systems that are incredibly secular. Um, and uh, I think that, that this fight that is before us is not just one of confronting radical evil, to quote Kant, uh, who said that if justice perishes, life on earth has lost its meaning. It is a spiritual battle. Mm -hmm. It is one because you know, we're, one day Cornell will be gone and I'll be gone and the battle will still be there. It, it, evil is not going away. Um, and yet it's the belief that that capacity to stand up and fight is one that is contagious, that, that courage is contagious, uh, that the struggle for justice is contagious. And I, I believe it is. I believe that there is, you know, always uh, that when I was booed off of that commencement stage. Other people said, well, you should have been more moderate or you should have. I got six letters from students who thanked me. And, mm. and everyone said, and I said to them, no, I was only speaking to those six people. <laughs> I wasn't speaking to anyone else. And, and I think when, when Justice's clarion call is made, um, it ignites that prophetic fire that you write about. And it's real, and it's powerful, and it's called love, and it is the greatest and most powerful and valiant force on earth.
Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, it's so great. Oh, that was one. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Lord, Lord, Lord. <laughs> That's Brother Chris Hedges. Our dear brother Chris Hedges.